Hi, my name is in Danish Peter Kjærulf. Uh, in English, that would be something like Peter Kjærulf. I would like very much to tell you a story about the Great Pyramid. And uh, this story uh, I cannot see as anything else but a recollection from a past lifetime. I have tried to find other solutions, but um, it all, all comes down to one thing I really actually remember. Uh, I, I mean, like uh, I remember yesterday or last summer, which you probably do yourself uh, very well. There's nothing mysterious about that. Um, it's quite a long story. So uh, my son Adam and I, Adam is behind the camera, have uh, decided to cut it into smaller bits. Um, it's part of the book I've written called The Ringbearer's Diary. And uh, if you would like to see something more about that, you can go into my homepage, which is uh, ringbearersdiary.com. So here we go. There's There will be um, maybe interruptions from family members or dogs. And please excuse my funny Danish accent. Um, and there will be an introduction first here. And I need glasses. The three pyramids at Giza stand in a diagonal arc from due north to approximately south-southwest. In the center rises the so-called Kefran Pyramid. It has the appearance of being the tallest structure because of its placement on a slightly elevated plateau. The most immense of the three, however, is the northernmost Cheops Pyramid, perspective and distance causing it to appear smaller. Moreover, the fact that the top is missing adds to this impression. To the south lies the smallest of the complex, the Mykerinus Pyramid. A short distance to the east, roughly, roughly in front of the Kefran Pyramid, lies the Great Sphinx, a lion's body with a human head. Egyptological research has long since decided that the pyramids must be the tombs of pharaohs. It is not possible to date them with certainty, since within the pyramids no trace of organic matter has been found, that is, material that may be dated by means of the carbon-14 method. So the decision has been made to link the time of the construction of the three pyramids with the three mentioned pharaohs and their estimated time of life. The dating has uh, oscillated somewhat, as archaeologists have not always managed to agree upon uh, which timetable to adopt. I've seen mention of the date 2600 before Christ as well as 4900 before Christ. It is not really known what the pyramids actually looked like, since only the Kefran pyramid has preserved some parts of the original casing stones. Of course, guesses are made on the basis of existing material and it is considered a matter of course that the pyramids were white and that the Kirps pyramid once had a capstone. Who removed the triangular capstone and why remains a mystery. As we know uh, that the inhabitants of the place have removed stones in order to build houses within the city now known as Cairo, it is believed that a capstone of the Kirps pyramid has gone the same way. Some people think that the whole enigma of the missing capstone will be solved on the day it is found. It is supposed to be made of alchemical gold and to lie somewhere in the desert sands, as the reader will discover by and by. In reality, the Ringbearer's diary is an alchemical uh, manual, so perhaps uh, the theory, symbolically speaking, is not half bad. As mentioned, the commonly accepted archaeological opinion is that the three pyramids served as monumental tombs for three pharaohs. Within the Great Pyramid, an ingenious system of corridors has been found, as my reader probably knows already. The current explanation of the function of this system of passageways supporting a theory, uh, which my reader may not know, that the architects of these master constructions, so impressive even today, were improvising during their construction 
and easily changed their minds, an idea seriously entertained by some researchers. First digging a long tunnel deep down so that the coffin could be placed deep in the rock under the pyramid. However, this, the lowest sepulchral chamber, is not completely finished. So this idea was probably abandoned after an initial excavation of a small dead-end corridor towards the south. One theory hints that the dead-end corridor was made by tomb robbers. Then a new tunnel was made diagonally upwards, upwards from the first one and a bit further on, on the horizontal level. But perhaps the building of this chamber was also regretted during the excavation. Anyway, the floor was not completed. But in that case, you can always place Pharaoh's woman in it. Thus, the origin of the name, the Queen's Chamber. Afterwards, a peculiar tall hall was built, approximately 42 meters long and 8 meters tall, leading up to the real funeral chamber, the King's Chamber. The function of this hall is unknown, the researchers say. At both sides along the hall, the floor is elevated and each of these, these lateral ramps is equipped with a row of hollows set at regular spaces. Within the king's chamber, no mummy has been found, nor any grave goods. According to official Egyptology, this is also owed to tomb robbers. What has been found in the king's chamber is a big stone sarcophagus, which is too big for it to have been brought in or out through the corridor. Clearly, the chamber has been constructed around it. The scientific theory of Egyptology meets with certain problems. Let us first discuss the tomb robbers. The dead-end corridor supposed to have been excavated deep into the ground by such individuals has been elaborated with great care. The tomb robbers have spent weeks polishing the entrance to make it distinctly rectangular, smoothing away all evenness that might hurt someone. And they have taken great care to make the floor in the dead end corridor even, and they have seen to it that the corridor has approximately the same proportions all the way through with even walls and ceiling. Also, they have conscientiously carried some 10-15 tons of limestone debris out into the open air. When this team of tomb robbers, or perhaps another such, plundered the king's chamber, they saw to it that chests, beds, chairs, chariots, mummy, and all the rest of the rich grave goods that we know from, for instance, Tutankhamun's tomb, were sawn into pieces small enough to be transported down through a shaft approximately 70 meters deep and only 50, 60 centimeters wide, and then upwards for 105 meters out into the light, where, presumably, the various parts have been glued back together in order to make them fit for selling. Next, the king's chamber was vacuum cleaned. As far as the capstone of the Cheops pyramid is concerned, several possibilities exist. The first is the theory that the stones have been used as building material. Instead of looting the pyramid from the base, people have climbed 137 meters up its steep side, where upon slowly and carefully the ton-heavy blocks have been lowered down to ground level. The remaining surface is the size of the ground area sufficient for a small bungalow, 20 meters times 20 meters, and the capstone would have been nine and a half meters tall. We are in the area of 2,500 tons of limestone. Perhaps it would look better, the ancient, ancient Egyptians assumed, if the disassembling of the pyramid started from the top. The other theory goes that the capstone has been covered with gold plates and the riddle would then be why not only the plates but also all the stones beneath have been removed. Uh, this takes us back to the first possibility, building material. Unless the capstone has been made of solid gold weighing more than 20,000 tons 
and that the neighboring populace has gradually carried away all the gold remelting it. To make a long story short, the last resort for the Egyptologists appear to be that the real burial chamber has not yet been found, or that Kirbs never put the building to use. However, this still solves not the riddle of the dead-end corridor and the passionately polishing tomb rubbles. Apparently, the idea that a coffin could be used for anything other than a burial is too remote from our current, current way of thinking. Perhaps one could learn something about death by lying down inside it. It appears that the date 2600 before Christ has been generally accepted as the dating of the construction of the three pyramids. The following recollection dates back to approximately 6000 before Christ. That was the introduction. Here comes the story. I stand in the desert sand to the right of the Great Sphinx, and I must choose between the three pyramids. The sun flickers, and the day seems unbearably hot, warmer than any other day I can remember. The rays of the sun are reflected by the white sides of the pyramids, adding an intense presence of light to the already blinding sunshine. The reflections are strongest from the pyramid farthest to the right, towards the north, because it is the only one which is totally white. The tall one in the center appears suspended in the air because the stones at its base are red for a couple of meters, seeming to almost merge with the red sand and the smallest structure to the left seems solidly planted in the sand with its darker coloring. It is red all over. I have just stepped out of the darkened covered chair. My priestly education has reached its climax, clim climax and the final examination consists of a confrontation with death and loneliness inside one of the three pyramids. Tomorrow, at dusk, they will transport me by boat down the Nile to the base of the plateau where the three stone giants stand. But today I must choose. My fear of placing myself in a higher position than necessary, an almost self-destructive feeling, causes me to think that I am perhaps expected to choose the small pyramid to the left. A priest must cultivate himself to be humble and a good listener who, by his modesty, will display a compassionate understanding for those who seek out his help. And one must not think oneself worthier than others, because one is a priest and has studied the teachings of the gods and the many hidden secrets of life. On the other hand, I do possess wisdom. As a priest, should one not be ready to show authority and to stand before all others as a living example? Who knows? Perhaps I have been chosen by the gods for some important mission. And in that case, I would be a fool if in an attack of self-destructive modesty, I judged myself to be less important than I am. Perhaps one of my teachers will find satisfaction in seeing I have the courage to be the person I have pledged myself to become, a mediator and a dispenser of the divine laws, someone all the people should be able to admire. I think I will choose the pyramid in the middle, the one that rises the most proudly out of the desert sands. This one is, to my eye, the tallest one, and the white one to the right lacking its Capstone seems strange. Still, there is an element to the one on the right which attracts me. It is as it is as if it is kinder than the others. Its sides incline in a certain way, creating in me a feeling of harmony and well-being. I am unsettled by its missing top section, as if they didn't bother to finish it. I sit down in the sand and seek the advice of my inner self. During my apprenticeship as a priest, I have learned how to empty my mind of thoughts so that my true self can express itself. 
I wait a long time for something to happen, but nothing does. It is as if my inner self has declared that the day has now come when you will choose for yourself. I am not. I'm now completely still and quiet, and I review the impressions the three pyramids have made on me. The first two structures stimulated, respectively, my self-underestimation and my pride, while the remaining one fills me with a feeling that it knows me and I know it. True, the top is missing, but priests do not actually ascend into the sky. And the mighty weight of these stone colossus seems held in a light grip by the angles of the sloping sides, which are neither too steep nor too flat. I will choose that one. Perhaps it is not the right choice, and if not, I will have disappointed my teachers. Yet there is something about its harmonious proportions that makes me believe in myself without being either self-destructive or boastful, as I have often been as a young boy. Now I am 15 and a grown man with no time for such childish behavior. I turn around to Oka, the chariot driver who has brought me to this place and the factotum of the temple to announce my decision. He bows wordlessly as, he left, uh, as his left hand lifts the dark red curtain of the coward sedan. I'm puzzled none of my teachers have accompanied me here today. But who knows what I would have chosen if uh, had I felt them constantly breathing down my neck. That day I am to eat nothing. I'm allowed only water. And the day after that I must meditate, also without food except for some small loaves of bread brought to my room in the afternoon. I must not speak and no one speak to me. Okar has passed on my decision to the directors of the temple. When the sun is low in the sky the following day, attendants come for me and I am dressed in a ceremonial loincloth. Already at midday I had been anointed with perfumed oils after my contemplation had been interrupted by the permitted swim in the lotus pool between the white walls. At least 20 priests are present in the exit room, as it is called among disciples, a room we have heard spoken of but never seen. The priests stand along the walls as I am taken inside. In the middle of the floor, on a small platform, stands a litter in the shape of a sarcophagus. Its lid, decorated with two big painted white wings, stand against the walls, uh, stands against the wall to the left. I am prepared for it all, and I lie down in a calm, serene state of mind on the green pillows lining at the bottom of the coffin. After the lid is put on, I feel a slight rocking mo movement as strong hands lift it from, from the floor. At one point I hear distant shouting and the beating of oars, as if the vessel transporting my coffin is being towed by another boat. Once again I feel the not unpleasant rocking as I am carried over sand or up a stairway, and then suddenly, as the lid is taken off, an abundance of colours stream towards me from the setting sun. The sky exhibits hues of every colour, from green through purple to violet, and the sun itself is just disappearing. As a strong hand helped me to my feet, I see the sun's luminous arc bid me farewell before I begin my journey into the darkness. I stand on a sort of scaffolding that I have never seen before. A long stairway, it is placed perpendicular to the northern face of the pyramid, wrapped in blue cloth. It is adorned, adorned with tall flapping pennants and in white and gold. Everyone treats me with reverence. My teachers and the other priests of the temple Apparently, they are all here, bow before me while crossing their hands over their chests. I stand there, dressed only in my loincloth, and return their greeting. 
The priests stand aside to reveal a massive open stone door, the opening creating a dark hole in the wall of the pyramid. I look at my beloved teacher and guide. My recollections have not delivered his name. The one who has taught me as well as his personal pupil. He nods towards me almost imperceptibly and I walk the few steps towards the dark entrance. Before I step inside the pyramid, I look at its golden red luminous face with a peculiar sense of awe. At this very moment, it is as if this mighty structure has been created for my sake alone. It is pitch dark. Even now, after almost 8,000 years, the booming thought of the hairy stone door still resounds in my ears. What a strange feeling, sitting here in a low and narrow stone corridor, in a darkness so black that at no time will my eyes see anything at all. The light simply does not penetrate here. I must recover a little. It is true that I am not afraid of the dark, but here I am, almost buried alive, in a colossal structure whose contents I do not understand, and I am expected to probe my way ahead to crawl one step at a time, judiciously and preferably not to move backwards. Not a sound can be heard here, nothing. The air is cool without being cold or mild without being warm, whichever you prefer. My breathing is rather excited. The serenity I felt when I stepped into the pyramid has been quickly displaced by a nervous anxiety. Is it possible for me to do this? Can I live up to the expectations placed in me? Have I really chosen the right pyramid? I push my way ahead as a probe with my hands everywhere. Nothing, just a regularly downwards sloping corridor. I begin to feel calmer. Until this moment there has been no direction to choose other than the one the corridor leads towards. Boy, what have I got myself mixed up in? Perhaps I should have become a farmer as my mother wished. And here I sit, in the middle of the dark. It feels as if someone has put me back into my mother again, as if I have never existed. The only way back out into life, the stone door behind me, is closed. And the future, if I have a future at all, lies at the other end of this darkened stone grave. But how do you get out again? Will I ever get out? If only it were all over. My thoughts tumble about chaotically inside my head, and in the utter silence it is almost as if they become dressed with sound and hit back at me, at my head from the confining the closed walls. But ahead of me the passage is open. I'm glad that this thing is not a square box. But what is this now? My fingers discover furrows in the wall and vertical junction, junctions in both sides of the corridor. Before they were perpendicular with the direction of the corridor. This must be a signal, a sign. Hooray! I'm going the right way. This probably means I must keep up my spirit. The grooves point upwards. Yeah, or downwards. Hmm. What is this supposed to mean? The corridor slopes downwards, but of course it may mean it actually leads upwards towards a higher knowledge or something. Anyway, it does continue the corridor. And there is probably a purpose for this. I mean, why make a corridor if you're not supposed to follow it? And there are no other corridors as far as I can be have been able to feel to the sides and in the ceiling. All at once the sensation overwhelms me that possibly something may suddenly open and lead me away from the downward sloping corridor, perhaps upwards. <laughs> Nonsense! My imagination is running wild. Under no circumstances will I be accused of wanting to escape 
through daydreams and strange notions. This here corridor quite clearly continues. Pull yourself together now. What a scandal it would be if I do something wrong and waste my time pressing my thumb against all unevenness that I can find in the hope of some secret door opening for me. Now, I had better move on. I've already wasted enough time here. The corridor goes on and on, seemingly unending. But I am probably doing the right thing. I mean, what else am I to do? My fascination, my fascination with being inside the pyramid seems all of a sudden to have lost its hold on me. I feel indifferent to it all now. As far as I can feel, I am also moving down under the pyramid, through rock. Hmm. Aha! Something is happening. The corridor changes and becomes straight. I move ahead faster and the walls disappear. The passageway widens into a room. Now I have made it. Well, that was easy. What's the big deal? Why all those ceremonies? I've completed the trials, taking no more than a couple of hours. True, the floor is rather curious. It rises in small steps, and here I almost bang my head against the ceiling. Back down again. I examine the walls. They are smooth. And the ceiling is even. Why haven't they finished the floor? I hope I have not arrived at the wrong place. Thank God! Here is another corridor. Well, the entrance is a bit smaller, but on I go. Perhaps that was why they had not finished the floor. No lying down and resting here. Move on, move on. Painstakingly I crawl further inside until the narrow corridor suddenly ends. Impossible! No, no! Now, be calm. Just lie down and be quiet a while, and then we will try to probe around again. There must be a hidden mechanism somewhere. <laughs> oh, I shall laugh when I have reached the other side of the closed door. Others who have been here have probably also been badly shaken. I knock on the walls and scrape nervously with my nails. An increasing sensation of panic cannot be suppressed. I lie, lie down for a moment, totally, totally quiet. Then I try again. It is difficult to do anything because the corridor is so narrow. Perhaps great force is needed to break down the door. And there is no possibility of swinging my arms. Who knows if there is a piece of wood or something like that outside in the chamber? I must have overlooked it. Back again. Only someone who has tried crawling on his stomach into a long blind tunnel, impossible to turn around in, can imagine my feelings here. But we have probably all been there, if not physically, at least mentally. That escalating claustrophobic sensation <clears throat> and the struggle to suppress it with the last remnants of one's self-control not yet succumb to panic. I was breathing dust, the corridors was full of dust, and in the dark, dust kept coming into my mouth. Laboriously I crawl backwards until I find space to sit in my meditation position for a moment, legs folded beneath me. Deliberately, slowly, I breathe in and out, to calm myself and recover again. Now, easy, easy, no panic. It must be here, somewhere, the rod, the battering ram, or whatever it is. Just still, sit still another moment. I crawl to the left of the unfinished inclined floor and further around in the space of the chamber. I've looked everywhere in this end of the room and now need to explore only a few more places I did not probe earlier because I had hurried into the narrow corridor as soon as I found it. Suddenly the floor disappears under my right arm and my head strikes the stone rim of a hole in the rock. This is more than I can cope with. The blow hits my brow over my right eye and everything blackens around me, if you can say that in a place that's already pitch dark. The mental effect of the blow is of a shocking character. The thought hits me 
like a bolt of lightning. All the stuff about battering rams and secret triggering mechanisms is something I have invented in my state of panic. The corridor is a dead end, no doubt of that. A voice within me says, how about climbing down the hole you have just discovered? Perhaps that is the way out. But I shake my head, denying the, this possibility. I have understood the situation. There's no reason for burying oneself even further. I have failed. This is evident. And of course, there is no exit through the hole in the ground, just as there is no exit through the blind corridor. So I have chosen the wrong pyramid and my life ends here. It is as if the pyramid has all of a sudden crushed me to the floor with all its ponderous weight. I must be located approximately beneath its center now. Up there on the ground it stands laughing at me. Are the priests also laughing or are they disappointed? And I felt that the pyramid had been raised out of the desert for my sake. I must be out of my mind. A mighty echoing thought, the sound of stone blocks colliding, confirms my fearful premonition. Now they close the corridor and abandon me, just as I had thought. Once again, the enormous weight of the pyramid above me crushes my soul and my thoughts down onto the rough stone floor. I lie on my stomach and bury my face in the bend of my left arm. I grow completely silent within. There's nothing left to say, is there? Slowly I fall asleep from sheer exhaustion, a long sleep of, of oblivion. To be continued. This was the first part.